routing just fine. Poetry is just like, oh, I have no interest in poetry, and I have to take this you long, have to write long and write seven, seven pages about it. No, analyzing it. Is that 301? It is. I don't have to write it in poetry. Why can't you write about a book? Yep, we're doing that later in the semester. But a book. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and take a look at the homework yeah. assignment. So I will give you the solution today, and then we'll talk about it. She's awesome, but she's hard. All right, let's go ahead and get started with this one. So I'm going to give you the solution of the binary search homework assignment, and then we'll start with the next one. The next homework assignment involves something that we will talk about today. We haven't talked about <coughs> it. So when we talk about that concept called a parameter, um, a by value parameter. You know, let's make sure that we pay attention when we get to that part. So we'll first go ahead and get started with this one. And okay, from what I have heard from uh, from a few people, the confusion is: what do we do with the variable called found? Nothing. <coughs> so we do. We we have encountered that sort of stuff already when we talked about um, short circuited Boolean expression. Uh, because I, we had to use a Boolean variable in order not to have two conditions on the same line so that you know you can avoid having you know to index out of range. So we talked about that already. We have some exposure to it already. But we'll go ahead and you know, deal with this one. <coughs> <laughs> All right. So here, it, here we have the the algorithm itself. So I think most people can track down, you know, everything except for line eleven. Line eleven is kind of mysterious because we have an assignment operation here. You can tell it's an assignment operator because we have a left arrow. But the assignment operator is really quite simple. It has a right hand side and the left hand side. The right hand side specifies <coughs> a particular value. The value can be a number, it can be Boolean in this case, it can be whatever it is. And then the left hand side is a variable which is used to store that value. So whatever it is on the right hand side is stored on the left hand side. Okay? So we'll go ahead and get started with this one. I think I would complete I would go ahead and complete all the traces in this case. We'll start with uh, Sheet two. That. And the screen is eh, a little bit, we can push it, you know, probably <coughs> just enough to do it. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the traces should not be too long, okay? It really should not be very long because, you know, the, we have a fairly small array here. It only has four items. <coughs> so we start with uh, line one, it initializes B to zero. Line two initializes E to bar A bar minus one. A has four columns in this case. So bar A bar is four. Four minus one is three. When then we go to line three, but line three we really don't trace because it only marks the beginning of a post checking loop. So we go to, we go to line four. Line four computes B plus E divided by two and then we take the floor of that. Um, one person sent an email to me and asked me about what is floor, and I sent back a link to the web page you know, that talks about the floor function. <laughs> <laughs> I so uh, the floor is the largest integer that is less than or equal to the number, in this case, b plus e divided by 2. b is 0, e is 3. You know, when you add them up, it, it's 3. 3, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5 but the floor of 1.5 is just 1 because it's the largest integer that is less than or equal to 1.5. So m gets a value of 1, <coughs> and we go to line 5, we evaluate the condition here. So we say a bracket m, m is 1. a bracket m is a bracket 1, which has a value of 0, is less than k, which is 8, is true. Then we go to line 6, line 6 changes b, so that it becomes m plus 1. m is 1. So B has to be changed to 2 in this case. Then we get out of the conditional statement. We go to line 10. Line 10, in lo on line 10 we have to evaluate A bracket M equal equals K first. Is that true or is that false? That's false. 
So do we have to evaluate the other side of the OR? Yes. Yep. So we have to evaluate the other side. B is greater than E is also false. So now we have false or false, which is false. So the entire thing is false. That means our exit condition has not been met. What do we do? We go back to the beginning. Go back to line four. So now we have two plus three, which is five. Five divided by two is 2.5. The floor of 2.5 is two. So M gets a value of two in this case. We go to line five. We evaluate the comparison. A bracket M in this case is A bracket 2, which has a value of 1. 1 is less than K, which has a value of 8, is true. We go to line 6 again. So this time we add 1 to M, which is 3, and that becomes our new variable B, or the value, the new value of variable B, which is 3. Then we get out of the conditional statement, we get down to line 10. Line 10 still has to evaluate A bracket M equals K, that is false. B is greater than E is false because they are the same. E and E are the same. So if so, the entire condition is false too. Uh, one person also sent me an email asking me about what is uh, what is the or? What do we do with or? And I sent back the link to. You. Yep. So on the comment on line ten, can we write that like a bracket m equal k e four and b greater than e e four? Yeah, yeah. You can say that each one is false. I mean, if you want to be more explicit, that's fine. So on line four this time, now this is interesting because on line four this time we have to evaluate. Um, oh, okay. On line four we have to compute the floor. This time we have three plus three, which is six. Six divided by two is three, and the floor of three is three itself. So m is three now, and then we go to line five. Line 5 has to do the comparison. A bracket M is A bracket 3, which has a value of 7. 7 is less than K, which has a value of 8, is still true. Then we go to line 6. We add 1 to M. So now to B. Um, B becomes 4, because it is, is M plus 1. Then we get out of the conditional statement. We go to line 10. And line 10 says, you know, is A bracket M equals to k. Nope, that's not the case. Um, what about b is greater than e? b is 4, e is 3, b is greater than e is true. And in a disjunction, you only need one side to be true for the entire thing to be true. So the entire thing is true, <coughs> exit condition, we get out of the loop, and then we get to the confusing line on line 11. On line 11, it is an assignment statement, which means we evaluate the right-hand side first. The right-hand side says, a bracket M equals K. M has a value of 3. A bracket M has a value of 7. 7 equals to K, which is 8, is false. So the right-hand side evaluates to a single value of false. And then we store that into the variable called found. So you can spell out you know, false, or you can just say F here, which is just as good. And then we are done. Yep. Oh, I was going to say, are you going to be nice about that? I'm going to try to be great again. But what did you I put there? I it depends on what you put there. I put something stupid, so I got it wrong. Did you put something? I mean, did you put something in column G? I did. Um, something yeah, like false, not true, zero. No, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> 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 it doesn't mean anything. Sort of you will get. It, it, you're going to get the minor thing of points because it really is all the way to the end. You know, the fact that you know how to get out of the loop is good however you know this is you know this is it, it's still worth some amount of points because you know for people who actually get it you know they should get the points too yep what if you put in the value if it's true you put in the value uh, of k but that's not what it does that is not what it does you just evaluate the right hand side whatever it is you store on the left hand side yeah. Okay. <laughs> so are we are we okay with this one? Any questions? Go ahead. Just 
Eight is not eight. Eight is not in on the bound. You will still get you know, just partial credit because you know, that's this is yeah, what it is supposed to do. Yeah. In the comments section in the last iteration on line ten. Uh, the last line 10 there, is it sufficient to say B is greater than E is true since only one of them has to be true? Um, if I reverse the order of the expressions, then it is okay just to say B is greater than E. However, since you know, the, uh, the, the pseudocode does list the equality first, so you still have to evaluate it using that order. So, you know, so it's not entirely correct. Now I understand that you know some people would be thinking you know how come sometimes you are kind of you know flexible when it comes to like you know you know having a semicolon or not uh, having you know um, using parentheses or not and other times I'm so picky you know you have to be it has to be like this you cannot have only one of the conditions or you have to indicate the result you know on, in this column that has to do with this class is trying to model what the actual programming language will do in your next class. So as far as modeling the behavior is concerned, I have to be very, very, you know, I wouldn't call it strict, but I have to, you know, do it the same way as what would what the computer program would actually do in that case. When it comes to expressing the logic, for those of you who don't want to use the OR symbol here and want to use two vertical bars in, like in C or some use um, some other ways, you know, to express the same thing, as long as I understand, that's fine. I can allow flexibility in those particular cases. But when it comes to the actual behavior of the program, I cannot have you know that kind of flexibility because you know you need to understand what the program will actually behave in the next class. You cannot negotiate with the C compiler. <laughs> so that's why sometimes I'm you know with certain things I'm you know very picky and other things I'm not really so picky. So I think that illustrates you know the enough that you guys know how to. Uh, deal with the other two traces. Yep. Okay. So we'll go ahead and close this, and then we'll talk about the next homework assignment. The next homework assignment is about parameters. <coughs> it's called subroutine one because we'll have several subroutine homework assignments. This is the first one. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this file. And here is your new homework assignment. For the most part, we know how to deal with this stuff already. Um, the Z is a global variable, so we don't, that's no problem. We know how to deal with it. It has a column that starts from the very beginning of the execution of the program, and it lasts until the program you know, gets to post. <coughs> why we know how to do the invocation. Two things you have to do. You have to um, allocate a column to remember the return line number, and then you continue execution in the subroutine. But you also have to make sure that you know that um, y has a local variable called, oh, y. Hmm? Yeah. When we put the local on the, a column, can we call it y1? Is there like two local y's? You call one y1, we call one y2? Just to. Oh. There's only one. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, if we get an, an, like, uh, an assignment like that, where there's two local y's and two subroutines. You don't need to differentiate because, you know, because the line of execution tells you which Y you should be using. You're always only using the left portion of the columns. So if you have yeah. one Y, you know, at the left hand side and then one Y on the right hand side, the right hand side one is the one that you're gonna use. Alright. Okay. That's a good question. But we don't you know we don't need any there's no need to differentiate between the two Ys. Yep. What do you mean by valve? Well, that's the new concept that we're going to talk about today. So, so that's why we have to kind of pay attention to the bival parameter today. So here we have a local variable y. I know you know they have the same name, but we, really it doesn't cause problems because uh, one is a variable, and the other one is the name of a subroutine. By context, they cannot get mixed up. Yep. Um, This is something that we'll talk about today. <laughs> okay, so this is something that we'll talk about today is, you know, what does that mean when we have a right arrow doing this? And I matches this name I here, but this is not a local variable. It's called a bival parameter. Okay, so this is what we'll talk about today. So I'll just kind of, I'll leave this one on screen for now. 
and then we'll continue to talk about you know those concepts. All right, so we'll go ahead and first of all, let me show you where we are at in terms of the notes. So the people who want to read the notes, that that should be everybody. Know you know what where this stuff is coming from. Okay. This is the first you know source of content you know local variables and parameters. However, there's also an updated subroutine notes down here. So you want to you know also load you know module 232, which is a more um, recent you know version of exactly the same thing. We are pretty much done with uh, section two and also section three. Now we are moving. We are done with section four as well. You know we were done with section four as of last Thursday. And now we are actually starting on section five. So do we know where to get to the class notes? You know where this stuff is actually coming from? Okay. But in the class, I don't really read from my notes because that's really boring. You know, if I if I wanted to do that, I would not have written my own notes. I would just pick a book and read from the book. <laughs> in fact, I would pick an audio book so the computer can read it for me. <laughs> or get one that has a Kindle version, plug in a Kindle to the speaker system. Then I'd just be go. sitting here and you know clicking the button, right? That'd be a lot easier. Be. Yeah, but it'll be boring. It'd be boring. Depends on who the, who the uh, voice person is. <laughs> there you go, that'd be interesting. Okay, so, so, yes. so now we are going to talk about by value parameters, okay? Now remember, yeah, yeah. The, the whole objective is that we want to get rid of global variables. Okay? We want to have enough mechanisms in place to do what we used uh, global variables for so that eventually we don't use global variables at all. Okay? And bival parameters are useful <coughs> because they can be used to pass information into a subroutine. Okay? So if you want a subroutine to compute certain things, a bival parameter allows you to specify the input into a subroutine. We don't have the mechanism to deal with the output just, just yet. There are two mechanisms to deal with the output, but as far as input is concerned, bival can do it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and talk about a few, you know, simple examples first, and then we'll talk about, you know, the recursion, you know, in the context of bival parameters. And then we'll move on and talk about how to get stuff out of a subroutine. You know, after you compute something, how do you get some the result out of the subroutine? Okay, no drinking of uh, you know anything that's sugary in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I heard that. <laughs> I heard the fizz. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. What if it's diet coke? Hmm? What if it's diet coke? Sugar -free. Sugar -free it's still it's still sugary and it will leave stain and sticky. All right, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this program here. Okay, it's very simple, and okay, the only purpose of this subroutine is to illustrate the purpose of bival parameters. So here I say bival. Now you can use one word, you can use two words. It really doesn't matter in this class. All you have to do is to indicate this is you know, passed by value. So we have x, we have y, and then here I just say that r gets x plus y, and define sub, and since I was talking about how we should be, uh, how we should not be using, um, well, let's go ahead and do it here, and in, on the outside of the subroutine definition, I only have one single statement, I say invoke add, okay, and then I say, well, let's use two to specify x, and then we'll use Oh, I don't know, seven to specify why. And that's my entire program. Okay. So now we have something that's new. R is some concept that we know already. Okay, R is not a local variable. It is not by val. It's not it's not mentioned anywhere else. So it's still a global variable. Okay, anything that we do not say explicitly what it is, you can still <coughs> consider those as global variables. So R as a global variable is accessible throughout the entire program. If I have a next line here, okay, let me just add one more line here to print the value of R. 
that's going to print the same thing as the computation of line 4 completes. Okay, so line 4 is going to store something into global variable r, and then on line 7, we're going to print the value of that global variable. So that concept we understand already. What we don't understand at this point is, what is x and what is y? They are not local variables, because you know it's, it doesn't say local x and local y. And it would not have made any sense if I said local x and local y. Because what is one of the properties of a local variable? When you first allocate a column for a local variable, what is the value of those local it's variables? Unknown. They are unknown. So what is unknown plus unknown? Unknown. It's also unknown. So that's no it's point. It's unknown times two. Yeah. Well, it's unknown plus unknown, not necessarily times two, because they can be two different unknowns. <laughs> but nonetheless, it is still unknown. Yeah. OK, so, so it would not have made any sense in this program to have you know, x and y being locals. Instead, they are bival. And we can also see the as association here. On line 6, ah, we mentioned something about x. And we also mentioned something about y. Okay, so let's go ahead and trace this program and see what happens. Because sometimes, you know, just looking at the mechanism of you know what it does, sometimes you know, we get a better understanding of the concept itself. All right. So here we don't need a comments column because there's no there are no conditional statements. So we can start with line number, <laughs> and we do we still have a local a global variable r. So we do have to make allocate a column permanently for local variable r. And as a global variable, it starts with an unknown value. And that's my precondition. x and y do not exist yet at this point. And then what we do is we start execution on the first line that is outside of the definition of all subroutines. So that means line 6. Line 6, well, the first part of line 6 we know how to do already. Whenever you invoke a subroutine, whether it has parameters or not, you still have to do the same thing. Allocate a column. Label it as return line number so that you remember where we're supposed to go back to when the subroutine is done. So we still have to do that. Okay, that part is nothing new. Return line number will be line 7 in this case. So we'll come back and we'll finish the printf statement. But let me just say this for now, and then you can, you can see it you know, in all the examples that we'll do today. A bival parameter is almost like a local variable. In other words, when you invoke a subroutine that has a bival parameter, you allocate columns for all the bival parameters the same way you allocate for your local variables. So in this case, we have one column allocated for x, one column allocated for y. So that part is the same. What is different between <coughs> local variables and bival parameters is this part here. If this were, if x were, was, if x was a local variable, I would have to put a question mark here in the cell to indicate that we don't know the initial value of a local variable. But because this is a bival parameter, it starts with a known value. And not only that, it starts with a known value, that value is specified by the invoke statement. Okay? So in this case, the invoke statement on line 6 specifies that x should start with an initial value of 2, and y should start with an initial value of 7. In other words, bival parameters are kind of like local variables, except they also connect to the invoke statement that invokes the subroutine. They are initialized by the invoke statement, not the subroutine itself. Are we doing okay so far with this? Can everybody kind of you know have a feeling that you know okay so this is how we pass information from the invoke statement into the subroutine so that the subroutine has something to process. Once we are done with setting up the columns, we continue execution in the subroutine. In this case, it, you know we only have really one line to execute here. R gets you know x plus y. X has a value of two. Y has a value of seven. X plus two, x, excuse me, x plus y is two plus n seven, which is nine, and then we store the value, we store the sum back into r, so r is now updated to nine, and then we move on to line five. Now, normally when we get to go to the end of a subroutine, we look up the return line number, 
so that we know which line we're supposed to go back to to continue execution. So we still have to do that, line seven. So we continue on line seven. And then the next thing we do is we deallocate everything that we allocated for this particular invocation. And we still have to do that. Did we have to do that with uh, local variables? Yeah, and it's the same way with local um, with by val parameters. As I said, the only difference is they start with initial values that are specified by the invoke statement. So we'll go ahead and finish this part. I no undo undo undo. Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. There you go. <laughs> Inverse function, I was about to say. <laughs> okay, so we put a bar across you know, to indicate these columns are now gone. And since now I have a printf statement, I do need a line, you know, a column called comments so that we can say what it is printing. Okay, so uh, you know, the result of 9, the value 9, is going to be printed on line 7. And then we're all done. So, are there any questions about the trace at this point? No. Nope. Okay. Can everybody associate, you know, this new concept called a by val parameter to something that we know already called local variables? Yep. Can you give an example where this would be uh, better suited versus defining x and y on line two and three? It would be a versus the way we have here. Instead of defining those on line two and three do what? Defining x and y on line two and three, uh, how would this, in a real world situation, help us out? We don't need global variables to pass in you know, what numbers we're trying to add. If we did not have bival parameters, in order for the subroutine add to know what we need to add, you need to use global variables to pass that information in. But now we don't, because now we can use parameters. So we are reducing the use of global variables. We don't need global variables to pass information into a subroutine anymore, because we have this mechanism. Okay, yep. What's the difference between this and then saying just local x equals two or whatever? Okay, very good. The question is, you know, what is the difference between this and having x on line two saying local, and then have another line in the subroutine to say x equals two, to, to, say, to say x gets two, right? Is that what your question was? Yeah. Okay, but that means the subroutine will always be fixed having a value of two. Now with this, I can change the program. Now I'm gonna, you know, just imagine, I can just add another invoke here, but every time I invoke, I can specify a different value or different initial value for x and y. You cannot do that if you have the initialization inside the subroutine itself. Okay. So this means the flexibility is on the invoke statement and not inside the subroutine. You don't have to make a whole new subroutine. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Very good questions. Any other questions related to this example? Questions? This is all good? We'll go back and take a look at factorial again. I think it is really helpful, you know, if we use the same example program like factorial, you know, time and you know every single time, so that, that way we can we can change that program gradually from what it was originally and then start to use the new concepts and we can see how the program or how the code changes and become actually simpler as we use you know, these newer concepts. So we'll go ahead and start a new one, and then we'll close the other one. All right, define sub factorial. But this time, since I have a bival mechanism, I'll make n a bival parameter. And the program actually becomes easier in this case, because I can say if n equals one, then r, the result, gets one, else um, I can say invoke factorial n minus one specifies n. Now this looks kind of confusing right now. I will explain you know how it is done. And we 
we'll say r gets r times n, and if n defines sub, invoke factorial. And the first time we do have to specify a constant like 3, and we'll just print the result out at the end. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this program and see how it is different from last time, because it is a little bit different from last time. All right. So here's our code, and here's our trace. Here. Are there any questions about the code itself, the pseudocode before we start the trace? Any line that you want me to explain in particular? I think the most mysterious one is actually line six, okay? Because every other line we kind of know how to deal with already. Uh, but line six is the confusing one because, you know, which n are we talking about, you know, when we say n minus one, and which n are we talking about on the other side, on the right hand side of the right arrow? So that's the only one I think that should be kind of confusing. But everything else we know how to do already. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with this. We have comments because we, we have con a conditional statement and also a print, up, a print statement at the end. Uh, we have line number. We have a global variable r. We don't have the mechanism to get rid of the variable r at this point. So we'll just have to deal with it for the time being. Okay, That's my precondition. N is a bival parameter. It does not exist until the subroutine <coughs> is performed. Just like local variables. Local variables do not exist until the subroutine is invoked. Okay? So for the most part, if you understand local variables, bival parameters are just like that, except they don't start with an unknown value. Their unknown values would be specified by the invoke statement. But in this case, the invoke statement can be inside the very same subroutine. So we'll go ahead and see how that can be done. We start with the first line that is outside of subroutine definitions. So that would be on line 10. <coughs> line 10, well, you know, the first thing we have to do is the usual thing. We allocate a column, we label it return line number, and then we say when we're done with the subroutine invocation, we go back to line 11. Okay. So that part is pretty easy to <coughs> understand. And then the second thing we have to do is to say, do we have any local variable? No. Do we have any parameters? Well, we do. We have n as a bival parameter. So we have to allocate a column for n at this point. Now, if n has a column, you should probably think about, but what do we put in this column at this point? A minus 1. Uh, well, which line invokes it? Line, line 10, right? Line 10 is the invocation. So what value are we using to initialize n in this case? Three. Three. Very good. So n starts with a value of three and not unknown. And then we continue execution in the subroutine, starting on line three. Line three is pretty easy. Three equals one is false. We go to the else. We go to line six. Well, you know, it's pretty much the same thing here. So we know that we have these two columns that we have to allocate. Okay, we need you know, column F and column G. We'll deal with the easier one first. Return line number. The invocation is on line 6. So when we are done, <coughs> we go to the following line, which is line 7 in this case. So that's pretty easy. The question is, what do we specify here? In other words, what do we, how do we interpret this thing here? N minus 1 goes to N. Well, let me ask you this question. Based on the direction of the arrow, which side do we evaluate first? The left. The left hand side. Okay. So we have to figure out what is n minus one. This n has no value yet. Okay. We are trying to specify the value of column G, so it, it is uh, it's blank. We are trying to specify it. Don't we just take the value from column column G minus one? Exactly. One? So the right hand side, this n minus one refers to the n that we already know. Okay? That's the n of this particular invocation, not the invocation that I'm setting up at this point. Okay? So this n on the left-hand side refers to column E, which has a value of 3. 3 minus 1 equals 2, and that 2, the resulting value of 2, is what we use to initialize column G, which is the n that we are trying to set up at this point. Is that okay? Yep. Say, like, you can use the value of n for that next um, subroutine because that's 
inside the subroutine that ends? It really doesn't matter whether it's in, whether this is recursion or not. You evaluate the left hand side first. In this case, it's not an assignment statement. Okay, you evaluate the right hand side first. Whatever the value becomes will become the initial value of this parameter of the subroutine that you're invoking. In this case, it just so happens that they are the same subroutine, but they don't have to be the same subroutine. If it was, let's say if it was like a different subroutine outside, you couldn't. Couldn't you not use them because it's like a... Then you have to use whatever name that subroutine uses. Okay. Yeah. So the name has to agree. This end has to agree with the name that the subroutine wants to use. Okay. Very good question. So now that we are set, we are done with setting up columns F and column G, then we can go to go back to the same subroutine because we're invoking factorial again. And it starts from the very beginning on line 3. N is 2, N equals 1 is false. Now, how do I know which end I'm using? Am I, how do I know not to use column E but use column G? Because you always use one farthest to the right. Exactly. Whichever one, whichever one is further to the right hand side. The rightmost one is the one that I want to use. It's also known as the current <coughs> context, you know, the context of your execution, the execution of the subroutine. Okay. Since that's false, we go to line 6 again. You know, this will be the last time we go to line 6. Line 6 invokes factorial yet again. So this time I'll you know, split the screen you know, horizontally like this. As we set up return line number and also n. Return line number is still 7 because the invocation is on line 6. The next line to execute is line 7. n in this case is going to be you know, specified by n minus 1. But we're using column G. I know column G is no longer visible. Let me just kind of scroll that around so that we can see it. Column G has a value of 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. So we are using that value of 1 to specify the initial value of column I. So column I now starts with a value of 1. We are done setting up the columns. Now we continue in the subroutines starting from the beginning on line 3. N equals 1 finally is true. Then we go to line 4. Line 4 is going to initialize R to 1. So R now finally gets its you know, initial value. And we are done with the conditional statement. We get all the way out to line 9. Line 9 is, doing, is going to do the usual thing. It looks up the rightmost return line number. It tells me to go to line 7 to continue execution. And then we say these columns are no longer needed. So we deallocate these columns. Are we doing OK so far with this trace? Now we're back on line 7. In other words, we're trying to compute r times n and then store the product into r again. Which n am, am I talking about? Which column? G. Column G, because column i is gone. Okay, So column G is my rightmost um, column that is labeled n. So it has a value of 2. What about r? One. r has a value of 1. 1 times 2 is 2. We store 2 into variable r, which is a global variable. So it gets a value of 2 at this point. Then we get to line 9 again. And we do pretty much the same thing. We look up the return line number. It tells us to continue execution at line 7. And then we deallocate those two columns. Okay. Are we doing OK so far with this? And then we now we are back to line 7 again. But column F, G, H, I are gone. We are now back to column D and column E. So on line 7, when we refer to R times N, that N refers to column E, which has a value of 3. R has a value of 2. 2 times 3 is 6. We store 6 back into variable R in column C. So column C is now updated to a value of 6, which is 3 factorial. We are done with the calculation. Then we get out of the conditional statement on line 9. And it is time to get out of the subroutine. We look up the return line number. It tells us to continue execution on line 11. And then we say that there there's no use of these two columns anymore. They are now getting deallocated. Forgot to copy the strike through. And now we're back on line 11. Line 11 is just printing the value of R, which is 6. So we just print the value of 6. We're done. And we get to post. Now, is this version of factorial a little bit simpler? It's, it's a little bit simpler than the, pe the, the one previous to this. Okay? And we also reduced the use of 
global variables. Okay, we don't have a global variable for passing info, passing values into the subroutine anymore. We need R as a global variable to pass results back out of the subroutine. So are we doing okay so far with the concept of passing by value, the by val concept? Doing okay with that? Okay. So let me make sure that we save this first. I'll call this factorial by recursion, by using by val. So this is factorial by val. Like that. But there's one more type of parameter called by reference, okay, B, uh, B-Y-R-E-F, by reference. So let's think about limitations of this concept of by val, okay? The next program that I'm going to write is a very simple one. All I want to do is to exchange the values of two variables. If x has 1 and y has 2, I want their values exchanged. So that x ends up with a value of 2 and y ends up with a value of 1. The concept of exchanging or swapping values between variables is actually very useful in many types of algorithms. So it's a fairly common thing to do and it makes sense to turn it into a subroutine. So we'll go ahead and talk about defub, defub, define sub swap, okay? And we'll say, well, let's make this more general. Instead of you know, swapping two particular global variables, we'll use parameters so that we can swap you know, any two variables <coughs> that we pass to it. Okay, so we say by val x, by val y, and you know, anyone who knows how to swap items know that you need a, you know, one extra space you know, to do it. So the code is pretty easy. T as a local variable stores the initial value <coughs> of x, once x old value is saved, then x can get the value of y, and then y can get back the old value of x, which was stored in t. Okay. And define sub like this, and then we'll have global variables in this case. We'll have you know i as a global variable. It is initialized to, let's say, 5, and then we have k as another var global variable initialized to, say, you know, um, 11 here, and then we'll invoke the subroutine. We'll invoke swap, and it will say i specifies parameter x, and k specifies parameter y, and then we'll find out what happens after this is done. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do all the proper indentations, line numbers, and then we'll go ahead and perform the operation. There's nothing wrong with the code of swapping, okay? That part is actually correct. But we'll see why this program has a problem. There's no need for comments because I'm not printing anything. So we'll start with line number. And this time we have two global variables. I is global and so is K. I skipped J because, you know, J looks too much like I. So I don't want to use I and J, you know, as variables because it's pretty hard to tell them apart. And these two start with unknown values as my precondition. So, and then on line 9, we initialize i to 5. On line 10, we init initialize k to 11. And then on line 12, on uh, line 11, we invoke the subroutine. We already know that, you know, how to do it. So we say return line number, in this case is post because there are no additional lines after line 11. But we also have to allocate for the parameters. This time we have parameter x and then we have parameter y. The question is, what do I put in? And t. Hmm? I forgot to oh, I also t. need to allocate for local variable t, very good. t is the easy one because it's a local variable, so it always starts with an unknown value. All right, what about x? What does it start off with? It starts with five. Now, we don't say I here, we say five. Okay, there's a big difference between whether I say I or whether I say five. They are entirely different things. Okay, I have to say five because what you do is when you have passing by value, you have to evaluate the expression 
to the left of the right arrow. Whatever the value of the expression becomes, that becomes the initial value of the parameter. In other words, you do not refer to the source, you refer to the value. If you're referring to the source, would it be a by ref? Kind of. <laughs> that, that, there's, there's a minor dif It's for, for our discussion, yes, it, that is basically the concept of by ref, but I don't use that notation anymore. So when we get to by ref parameters, we'll, we'll see how it is represented. There was another hand. Yep, go ahead. Can you repeat that one more time? Okay, instead of using I, you know, where the current cell is, I have to say phi. The difference is, do we track the source of, you know, the information, or do we just specify the value of that expression? In other words, in other words, what we are doing here is, when we look at this expression I here, it is as if this is I times one or I plus zero. Okay, it specifies a value. It does not specify where it's coming from. Okay, now that is a very, very important top, uh, important discussion because what we know now is when you have passed by value parameters, you cannot have names of variables here. You must have exact numerical values or true false values or some kind of value that is just there, literal constants, cannot be a reference to something else. Okay? If it's a reference of, for something else, it's called passed by reference. Yep? I would, um, <coughs> why did you put the, um, the, uh, the numbers uh, on I, or why, did, why aren't they on the invoke statement in, in, in this example? Is it just because you're just trying to show us? Sorry? Because before you, um, you gave values to uh, like x and y on in the invoke statement. Right. Yeah. I still do. I mean, they start with a value of 5. But, but and what's 11. the need of i and k then? How come you don't just put those numbers on the invoke statement? Because I want to find out what happens to i and k. Because remember, well, that's a very good question. We'll, we'll track down this algorithm and then we'll see the point of this entire discussion. Uh, I was just wondering if that's. I think, you're getting, I think you're getting the concept already. Okay. <laughs> that's why you're asking that question. Yeah. Okay, but the rest of the class may not, you know, have, you know, gotten the, the point of this illustration. So we'll go ahead and continue with this part. Are there any other questions? No other questions? So at this point, you know, we'll go ahead and see whether the swap subroutine is going to swap, exchange the values of these two parameters. Okay, so we'll continue execution in the subroutine starting on line 5. T gets X. Okay, so t gets a value of 5, we get the line 6, x gets the value of y, so y has a value of, of 11, x gets a value of 11. On line 7, y <coughs> gets the value, value of t, t has a value of 5, so y gets a value of 5 at this point. So when you look at this portion of the trace, they, their values are exchanged. Okay, the swap logic is correct, it did the right thing. And then what do we do on line 8? Erase them. Yep. On line 8, the first thing we do is to say, okay, we'll continue execution at post. Okay, that's the easy part. We know that. Um, and then the next thing is, whatever we allocate for this invocation, we deallocate. So now we say these no longer, they are no longer accessible. So by the time you get to post, did we exchange the values of i and k? Yeah, you yeah. sure did. No, we did not exchange the values of column B and C. We exchanged the values of copies of no, those values. True. Namely, in this case, column C and F. So five val parameters have their limitations. They can only be used to pass information into a subroutine. You can do whatever you want in the subroutine. But whatever you do to the local variables in this case cannot be passed out again because everything that you allocate per invocation gets deallocated at the end of the invocation. That kind of, you know, that's, that's not useful, right? I mean, this swap subroutine definitely is not doing what it is supposed to. What if you said uh, y, y refers to i or something like that? That's what we want to do, and that's why we have the next 
type of parameters called passing well, by well, reference. Well, couldn't you just at the end of the subroutine make you know, swap the values before you exit the subroutine? Sub sub but you have to want to swap with in the inside the subroutine. But I may I may have twenty variables in outside of this subroutine that I want to do the, the swapping with, but your subroutine doesn't know which two that we want to you know deal with. Okay. So that's why you know that's why we have a limitation here. Let's go ahead and save this file and then we'll fix it, right? So we'll say this is um, limitations of my valve. Okay, so the file name implies you know what point is trying to illustrate here. And then we'll save the file again, but this time we'll say swap by rep. Okay. So we are going to change the program. We will fix this program. And we'll it will fix the program, but the trace is not going to be completely different. In fact, the code is not going to be changed all that much. Instead of by val, we say by ref. Ref R E F stands for reference. Okay, so we are changing passing by value to passing by reference. And just to switch back to the notes here, we are now up to section six, passing by reference. But when we use passing by when we use passing by reference, we also have to remember to change the uh, the shape of the arrows. Instead of being single sided and the left the right arrow, now be they become double sided arrow. Okay, so these two changes have to go hand in hand in this class. When you take C plus plus, you know they don't really use these symbols anymore. Um, that makes the programs you know so much harder to actually understand because. You have to look up how parameters are defined in order to understand how you know it is used. But in this class, we make it very, very explicit so they can track things down easier. And we will go to, let's see, the second screen, and continue the trace. Okay, lines line nine and ten, you know, they're pretty easy, so I, I kept those two. Now we are on to line eleven again. Line 11 has pretty much the same thing to do regarding the return line number. Uh, we, when we're done, we go back to post. No big deal there. Well, we still have our local variable t the same way as before. It still starts with an unknown value, just like before. So that part is pretty much the same as before. The question is, we have parameter x and we have parameter y. In other words, in this case, or in all cases, whether it is by val, by ref, or local, they are still allocated on a per invocation basis. Okay, so that part is still the same. They're still allocated on a per invocation basis. The question is, what do we say about x and what do we say about y when these are passed <coughs> by reference? So let's go ahead and take a look at, at x here. x basically becomes an alias of i. It's just another name to refer to the same column. Okay. In fact, I will go as far as saying that I, you know, the, the, the identifier I is nothing more than an alias of the column that we call column B. And K is nothing more than an alias, a name for column C. Okay. So what we have here is X is now also going to refer to the same column. Mm -hmm. So the way I specify in this class is, you know, x becomes an alias, so that's why I use the aka also known as notation. It is also known as column C, and y is also known as column, oops, I got swapped, aka column B, aka column C. If you don't like the word, you know, aka, you can say refers to, column B and refers to column C, but at any rate, they're no longer the usual thing that we used to deal with. Okay. But that's just a notation difference, okay? The real difference it shows when we are going to change the parameter X and parameter Y. We continue execution in the subroutine onto line five. Line five is not too hard, okay? We can still kind of e do this one easily. Because this is just an assignment statement, we evaluate the right-hand side first. The right-hand side refers to x, we look up x, x is also known as column B, we look up column B, 
column B has a value of 5, no big deal. Okay? So the right hand side of line 5 evaluates to a value of 5. We store that in local variable T. T has a value of 5. Is that part okay? Okay? It's just you know, one extra step to track down what exactly is the value of x. Oh, okay, I don't know, but you know, that column knows. But line 6 is the interesting one. The right-hand side of line 6 is the same thing. You look up y, y is also known as column C. Column C has a value of 11 at this point. No big deal, the right-hand side is easy. What do we do with the left-hand side? The left-hand side on line 6 says we want to store it to x. Now in the previous case, we go to x and then we change column E to reflect the answer. But this time, we don't do that. Okay? Because column E, or our parameter x, is nothing more than a pointer, a reference, and you know, just saying, hey, don't do anything in this column. Do it to column B. It's a it's a symbolic link, you know. If you will, you know, borrow from your Linux, you know, operating system, it's a symbolic link. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I mean, that's a that's a good analogy once you understand what a symbolic link is. But not everybody in the class has taken that class, and uh, see, shortcuts in Windows are not the same. They are not. They do. They don't work the same no. way. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Does anyone watch um, no. Farscape? Oh, yes. wait a minute. Okay, so we got, so, so people, so you understand what a wormhole is, right? Uh, how about Babylon 5? Whoa, did you say Babylon 5? Yes. Uh, well, it's one person who lost cares. <laughs> Watch things to have okay. Did you guys grow up in the 90s? <laughs> it's a wormhole. I just okay. never watched Babylon 5. <laughs> Parameter X is a wormhole, okay? It's, it's, it's an opening, but when you put something into that space, it connects to another space, another spot of space. So whatever you do to X, you are really doing that to column B. Okay. So that's why when you store something to X, you don't change column E. You actually change column B. So that's why on line six, column B gets updated to eleven. If you don't like AKA to column B, you can say wormhole to <laughs> column B. It means the same like thing. Symbolic link. Or sim link to column B. Yes. Okay. Or a reference. Okay. Now I know you know, regardless of you know, the sci-fi terms that I use, it's not going to connect. You know, not, not everybody will connect to those terms. So let's think about the library. Okay. So let's just say that you know I am a I'm an editor, okay? And one of the things that I can do is spell check. Okay? I can you know I'm a subroutine, I can do spell check. And in order for you, you know, the invoke, you know, from outside of the subroutine to tell me which book to spell check, you have to pass something to me. You have to give me something so I can work with that book or paper or whatever to spell check. Does that make sense? I need some kind of input. Okay. Passing by value means that you will make a copy of the book that you want me to spell check and you give me the copy, you give me the, the, the Xerox of the book that you want me to spell check. So I would go ahead and flip through all the pages and make corrections, highlight stuff and whatnot. And then at the end of my operation, what do I do with that copy of a book? You I toss it into the shredder. So what do you get back? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, you, you make a photocopy, you give me the photocopy. I don't give the photocopy back to you, I just destroy it. When it's done, I, it's back, it's in the recycle bin. Okay, is that analogy working? That's by value. Okay, by value means you make a copy of something, the subroutine uses the copy to do everything. What about passing by reference in this context? You are still giving me something, but not the book itself. You give me a little slip of paper with the call number of that book in the library. Okay? Does everybody understand the difference? Instead of giving me a thick book, okay, let me see if I can find a prop here. Uh, this is a school and I cannot find a book. 
Okay, so instead of making a photocopy of you know, 600 pages, 300 pages, or whatnot, give me an entire pile of paper that I will toss away in the end, you give me a little <coughs> slip of paper with simply the call number to that book. Okay, so as a subroutine, what do I do with that call number? You look at the book. I go to the library, I look at the book according to the reference number. So when I actually do the spell check and highlight stuff and fix stuff, what am I doing? Actually change. I'm actually changing the original item in the library because the reference, the reference number, the call number, allows me to find the original thing. Are we doing okay so far? But the analogy doesn't stop there. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> when I'm all done marking up, you know, that book in the library and upsetting, you know, certain librarians in the process, <coughs> I'm done. So what do I do? I still have a little slip of paper. Whatever you give me to start the operation you know, per invocation, I have to destroy. So what am I destroying in this case? Yes. Not the book in the library, but just the reference number. Okay, the, call, the little slip of paper with the call number is the only thing I toss into the recycle bin. Are we doing okay so far with that analogy? Okay, so between the sci-fi stuff and the library, I'm hoping that most people get the, the idea. <laughs> All right, so continuing with this you know, particular program, now we know what line seven is going to do, don't we? Line seven picks up on the right-hand side is just the local variable t. So local variables in this context or in this particular example is nothing more than little post-its that I have to use in order to do my spell check, okay? You, as somebody outside of the subroutine, don't even get to see my post-it little notes because if that's entirely internal to the process of spell checking. But in this case, T, you know, the little post-it has a value of five, and we are going to store that to Y. But Y is really a call number, <coughs> a reference, a way to find the original item, and that is in column C. So column C is the only is the column that gets updated to a value of five. As a general rule, when you have AKA something, when you have a parameter that is passed by reference, you don't change that column. You change whatever the column refers to. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of passing by reference? Okay. So now after line seven, we get to line eight. Line eight it still has to do the same thing as before. It looks up the rightmost return line number. It tells me to continue at post. And it still has to destroy everything that we allocated per invocation. In other words, these four columns still have to be deallocated. But are we doing anything to column B or column C? Nope, column B and column C remain, they, all, they both remain changed. So the swap operation was actually successful. It was effective this time. Because when we actually do the assignment statements on line six and line seven, we are not changing the parameters e on, on, in column E and column F. We are only using column E to find column B. We are only using column F to find column C. All the changes are made to column B and column C. But let me ask you another question. Did we mention global variables i and j, I mean i and k at all, inside the subroutine? Nope. That's, the, that's, the, that's why we have passing by reference. It allows a subroutine to access columns that are allocated before the invocation of the subroutine, and yet it doesn't need to know the name of those global variables. And therefore, we have just you know, invented another mechanism to remove global variables from our programs. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. <coughs> well, we have quite a bit of time, so we'll go ahead and save this one first. And then we'll go back to, guess what? Factorial. Yes. Okay. And this time, I can completely eliminate the use of any global variables, okay? This is the first semester that I try to eliminate 
the use of global variables all together in, you know, at this point of the class. So we still have defined sub factorial, okay? And we still have by val n, but this time we have by ref by ref r. In other words, we use by value to pass information into a subroutine, but then we use by reference to pass information out of a subroutine. Well, with factorial is pretty clear cut. We know to know we need to know which number that we are finding the factorial of. But once we compute the factorial, we use you know, parameter r to pass the information back out. So that part is pretty easy. And then the code is identical to before. If n equals 1, then r gets 1, else uh, invoke factorial. This part is a little bit different. We still have n minus 1 specify n, but we need something to specify r. Well, we'll use r to specify r. Okay. My result is your result. Your result is my result. Okay? And then my result is result times n. And if n defines sub. Okay, so we have the first subroutine done because we have a second subroutine that we have to do. Okay. So here's another subroutine. And for the back uh, for the lack of a better name, I call this one stub. Okay? The word stub in the context of programming typically refers to the name of a subroutine that really has nothing that is true too meaningful other than you know having a mechanism to define local variables so that we can avoid the use of global variables or just a stub to you know it's a stand in for something else something to be specified later but in this case it's really just uh, so that we can avoid the use of global variables altogether so we have local variable let's say x here and then we'll say invoke factorial, and we'll give it a number. Let's say I think we 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 have we know enough about you know that stuff, so we can start with a two in this case. So two specifies parameter n, and we use x to specify parameter r. Or well, we'll, we'll just make this a little bit better. Print x here, and then we are done with the stub subroutine. And in the in the very outside of the entire program, we just say invoke stub. Do we have any global variables in this program? No. There's absolutely no global variable. And but we have a few we have a few questions now because there are two things that we are doing with our passing by reference. On line 13, we are passing a local variable to by reference to R. Okay, that's one thing that we haven't done before. And then on line 7, we are using a parameter passed by reference to me. I'm passing by reference again to somebody else. Okay, so we haven't really quite explained how that works. So this would be a good example to illustrate those two particular cases of passing by reference. And I think you will not be surprised at all, you know, of what we are how we're gonna treat that. So we'll say factorial by val by ref because it uses both of these parameter types. <coughs> For those of you who are thinking, oh man, you know, we are done with the factorial program now because now we are not using global variables, and we're not quite done yet. And there's another concept called return value, and it will simplify the algorithm even further. Okay, it will be e an even better algorithm after that. Okay, so we have comments, we have line number, and pre has nothing to say because we don't have global variables anymore. We have completely eliminated the need of global variables. All right, so since there's nothing to say here, we'll start with line 16. Wow, the entire program is one single invocation. Line 16 invokes stub, so it has to you know, specify the return line number. Since it's the last line already, the return line number is just going to be post. But we also have to remember to allocate for the local variable x of stub, which starts with an unknown value. Okay. So showing those two columns, continue execution inside the subroutine called stub on, line, on to line 13. 
line 13 only invokes another subroutine factorial. Okay, we know how to do that. The invocation has to allocate the return line number to indicate which line we're going to return to. Since the invocation is on line 14, we return to line, excuse me, since the invocation is on line 13, we return to line 14 when it is done. Okay, so that part is not too hard. Next one is n. n is easy because we are on line 13 right now. n has, it's pretty clear, we use 2 to specify the value of, <coughs> of the five-vowel parameter n, so it has a value of 2. Now we have to think about x, I mean r. What do we say here? X is the same as r. R, R refers to a column. It doesn't refer to a name of a variable. Yes. It refers a to a column B. Hmm? A column, B. It refers to column, B. column D. That is correct. So R is an alias, a wormhole, a call number to, in this case, column D. Are we doing okay so far setting up col columns E, F, and G? Why D? Because we are on this line, right? Because we are using X to specify parameter R. X is nothing more than a name of column D. A column can have multiple names. Like in this case, it has a name called X in from the context of stub. But when we are in factorial, it is also we can also refer to column D as parameter R. Are we doing okay so far with this code up to this point? Okay. All right. So we are now getting into the subroutine onto line four. This is old stuff. You know, we have done this already. On line four, we compare n, which is our by vowel parameter, which has a value of two right now. n equals one is false. Okay. No big deal. We, we have done this part already. Then we get on to line seven. On line seven, we have done a good portion of that already. So the first part is not going to be too mysterious. Let me try to change the uh, display so I can show you, you know, all the columns. Okay. So on line 7, we are going to invoke factorial again. The first part we know how to do, you know, return line number is just, you know, whatever line is following line 7, in this case line 8 is whatever follows line 7. And, and we also know, because, you know, last time we already, kn already know, on the left hand side of the right arrow, we refer to the end that we know already, which is column F, it has a value of 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, the new value is used to specify the column that we are trying to construct at this point, so N, this N of column I has a value of 1. So that part we know already. What we do not know yet is column J. Okay, how do we set up parameter R, which is passed by reference? A what am I using to specify R? I'm using a parameter that is already passed by reference to me. So now most people will understand, okay, we have two choices. Either we can say column J is aka is a wormhole to G, column G, and then from column G, we can track down column D, or we can track all the way, we can use column J and say this is AKA column D and go straight to column D. Which one do you think is? Yep. G. 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 It's actually G. column D. Is it? Yep. It takes, it takes the <laughs> shortcut. It just shortcuts all the way to column D. In other words, in the, in the analogy of using a call number, Okay, remember, passing by reference is to give somebody a call number to find an original book. Would you, do you think you have a call number of a call number? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, right? You do not have a call number to a call number. So what you do, when someone gives you a call number and say, oh, do blah, blah, blah to that book in the library, and you want to subcontract out to somebody else to do something to that book, you don't make another call number <laughs> for this call number that you have, you just make a photocopy of the call number and give it to the subcontractor and say, okay, you know, in order to do your work, use this call number. Okay. Is that okay? I mean, does everybody understand you know, when, you use, when, you, when you have a parameter that is passed by reference to you, if you need to pass by reference to somebody else, 
you just pass that reference along. You do not pass a reference <coughs> to a reference. Is that okay? Yeah. That's a very, very important concept to remember. So in this case, this R is the same way. It's just AKA column D. So in other words, we have two wormholes that connects to the same point at this point. Okay. Getting onto the program, once we set up the columns, we continue execution on line four. Line four says this time ND plus one is true. Then we move on to line five. Line five wants to update column D to one. Now, why do we want to call? Why do we want to update column D? Because it refers to R as on the left hand side. R is column J. Column J says, oh, "Don't modify me. I'm only a reference to column D." So column D is now updated to a value of one. Are we doing okay so far with this part? After line five, we get out of the subroutine. So at this point, I think I can get back here onto line 10. I just need to refer to the line number. So now we are onto line 10, which is the end of a subroutine. So we have to remember the next line to execute is line eight, according to column H. And then we have no use of these three columns anymore. So we say they're now deallocated. And I'm going to change the uh, screen again to a side by side because we don't need that wide format anymore. There we go. <coughs> now, when you do this at home, you won't encounter you know, the same problem that I, I'm having now because you can run your screen at its full resolution because I have to use a larger font and magnify this to 160% so that people in the back can see it. But when you run your screen at you know nineteen twenty or sixteen eighty by you know one thousand two hundred, you know you're not going to run into this problem, unless you want me to give you an assignment that uses up in the entire screen, even if you you know maximize your you know spreadsheet. No, I'll do yeah. pass. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is our <laughs> You can just do a screen then. Oh yeah, there we go. Are you? That would be a good excuse to ask your spouse or your mom or your dad to buy you a, another screen. I need to do my homework assignment. I need another screen to do it. The thing is, they'll just give you this crappy piece of crap that you don't even CRT. like. <laughs> oh, yeah, the CRT. There you go. All right. So we are back on the line. Okay. So getting back to our code here, columns H, I, and J are now gone. And our execution point is now back to line 8. Line 8 is right here. It wants to compute the product of R and N. R is column G. It refers to column D. Column D has a value of 1. N refers to my bival parameter N, and it has a value of 2. 2 times 1 is 2. I store the result to R which refers to column D, and so that's why column D is the one that is updated to a value of two. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. After line eight, we get out of the conditional statement. We get to line 10, same thing. We look at the return line number. We have to continue on to line 14 in this case, and then we have no use of these columns anymore. Just deallocate those. Right cells, just right through. You're not storing two in D. You're supposed to be storing two in R. Yeah. Yeah. Which is D. But it is. R is a reference to column D, and that's why column D is the one that gets updated. <laughs> wormhole. Yeah. Wormhole. <laughs> yep. It's a portal. Dang oh, that's that's another one. You know, if you if oh, you yeah, play the, the game wormhole. Portal. That's yep, a that's game. another reference. <laughs> I don't like that game. You don't what? like that game? What is wrong with you? <laughs> I like Half Life 2 more. I don't like that game that much. You don't have a lot of Half Life 1. You know, you know what you do is you get Portal and you put the Half Life 2 maps in Portal and you play you play Half Life 2 with the Portal again. It's awesome. You, <laughs> shoot, you put the Portal somewhere, you shoot through the Portal, it kills people. It's awesome. <laughs> portal is a, is a, for those of you who don't know you know what Portal is, how many people know what Portal is? Go to Steam right now. All right, the whole, the whole set. Yes, everybody okay, good. <laughs> 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 don't know if we're losing control.
Portal really is a. I would say Portal is not. A, it's it's actually kind of like a geek type of game. You know, it, even though it's it can market itself as a first you know, person shooter, it's more well, of a puzzle solver no, than there's anything else. No guns else. in it except for the gun turret. Yeah. So I mean, you still kill people. <laughs> I like you know I like it when you have to hop a few times you know to get to a certain point you know and you have to fire the gun when you are you know in air you know, in order to open the portal at the right space. Oh yeah, that's, that's hard. Okay, no. So now I'm illustrating the whole point of you know, having a trace because I can that get distracted, talk about portal and all we want. <laughs> and in well, the end, in the end, I can come back and know exactly where to continue. Okay. Because the trace is remembering the entire state of the program. Parameters, local variables, execution point, we store everything in this representation. So back on the line 14, we have to print the value of x. x has a value of 2, because x in this case is just a local variable from the perspective of stub. So we are printing the value of 2 here, we get to line 15. We look up the return line number, we continue at post, and then we deallocate these two columns. Yeah, and we're done. Okay, yep. So if we want to use, if we want to detect anything other than two, and that will still have to have a little zero. Where R refers to column D again. So you, you're just embedding one more level, but all of your parameter R will refer to the same column. So you will just be updating the same column, except in this case, you will have to update it one more time. Like after like after like fifteen, right? After like fifteen, yeah. You erase the value of x. What's the point? I print it out. I print out the value of the uh, two factorial before I get up. So it's computed. I made use of it because I printed it out. So the purpose of the program is accomplished. Yep. Um, about the binary search homework.